ought to be our prayer request on a daily basis. Well, welcome back to Bethel Baptist Church tonight. Good to see everybody. Good to see some visitors with us. Good to see the, the Whitaker family. If I got, I got that one right. Hallelujah. If you get to know me for very long, you'll know very quickly names are like my Achilles heel. It just, it really eats me alive. But uh, I, I've, I've known Brother Bell now ever since I got here, and half the time I try to forget his, no, I don't, <clears throat> but, um, but it is good to have the Whitakers with us visiting, and so thank you so much for everybody being in God's house. Let's take our hymn books, and let's start off tonight turning to hymn 430, I Must Tell Jesus. Let's all stand, get a good deep breath of air in those lungs, and let's sing out like we love the Lord. Hymn 430, I Must Tell Jesus, on the first. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Jesus can help me Jesus alone On the second I must tell Jesus All of my troubles He is a kind troubles victory and pain. I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Jesus can help me Jesus alone that third verse, so important when you read it. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world of victory to win. We have the opportunity to be more than conquerors. But we got to go to the source. This flesh can't do it. This flesh is lured to sin. But only through Christ do we have the victory over that sin, over the temptation. Let's sing that last verse. Appreciate who Christ is for us. Here we go. Oh, how the world to evil adores me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus and he will help me over the world. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Amen. Good singing. Brother, Brother Charlie, would you uh, open us up in prayer this evening? Amen. You can be seated. Let me just give you some of the announcements that, uh, that I did give this morning. Of course, if you did not get a church bulletin this morning, there are more in the foyer. Uh, try to get one of those. It kind of gives some updates as to some things that are right around the corner and uh, there's upcoming dates that to look forward to. But uh, just for heads up, don't forget about uh, VBS. We are uh, going to be operating that. That's, that's cranking up. One week from tomorrow, all right? It's going to go from 6 o'clock in, in the evening to 8 o'clock in the evening, and it is for ages 5 to 12. And so 
And we just had our meeting uh, today, just a little while ago, and thank you so much. So many folks came out to be a part of that meeting. Looking forward. We have, we have that kind of involvement here. I believe the Lord honestly is going to bless the heart of the people wanting to get involved and be a part of things uh, such as VBS, getting the gospel out, not just to little kids. You never know the adults that'll be here as well, especially on Friday night. That's going to be our family focus night. And so our des desire is to get the kids excited about being here all week long. And then on Friday, uh, then be excited about getting their parents here. Because, of course, Friday nights when you get out, give out all the major awards and stuff like that, that uh, the kids have earned through the points by learning scripture verses, different things we're going to do. And, and so we want the parents, we want the families to come on Friday and uh, that just gives that much more opportunity to give the gospel to some folks maybe that have never heard a clear presentation of what Christ has done for them so uh, pray about that I would ask you folks please please be in prayer all week long that the Lord would bless uh, VBS here at Bethel Baptist Church starting on Monday this the 22nd and so uh, Y'all just be in prayer about that. Also, there are flyers in the foyer. Please grab those flyers. Let's get them out. Encourage folks to go to um, the online registration if possible. It kind of gives us a better idea, just kind of a simple starting head count of some folks to expect. And uh, also gives them an, a feeling of commitment. They signed up. They're ready to be here. And so encourage folks to try to go in and register themselves to be a part of it starting out there on July 22nd. All right. Don't forget. This coming Saturday, in preparation for VBS, we will, uh, at 10 o'clock, typically at 9.30, we would have visitation. And uh, if somebody still wants to go out and do that, that's not a problem. We can have some places for you to go, or you can just take flyers and hit some neighborhoods and let them know about VBS. This coming Saturday, you could do that uh, in visitation if, if you want to do that. But otherwise, uh, we are going to be busy trying to get things ready here in the auditorium and uh, next next Sunday like I said is going to be very interesting we're going to uh, <laughs> we're, we're not going to look the same come next Sunday uh, we're going to have an entire camp out going on up here on, on the platform uh, directly behind the preacher and so if I get hungry I'll just I'll go cook me a s'more and uh, and I'll eat while I'm preaching but um, but we'll uh, we'll have all that set up we'll start at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning so if you can come out as I said many hands will make light work uh, I, I will, as well as we've had uh, Brother Bill's grandson, Jordan, helping us out. And uh, Brother Bill might have to be over here as well. He, he's been supervising the whole thing. And uh, <laughs> But um, we'll, I know myself and Jordan for sure will be working feverishly on the remainder of the construction in the doorway right here, trying to get that finished Saturday so we can get all that construction out of the gymnasium because that's where a lot of this is going to be taking place when it comes to the snack and craft time. we got to get that stuff out of there and make the doorway safe. So we'll be working that. If you can come and help uh, to set up in here, more hands, less work. And so if you can be a part of that starting at 10 o'clock Saturday, greatly appreciate it. Then also at 4 o'clock in the, in the evening on Saturday or late afternoon, however you want to call it, is uh, going to be our fish fry, the church-wide fish fry we're having. And we call it a fish fry, but we have decided to have hamburgers as well for those of you that may not want fish. And, uh, and so we're going to be doing that at Spartman Park. We have the pavilion there set aside for the entire day. That way, any time we want to get out there, if we're done here early, people want to go out there and have a good time, we can start any time you want. But the goal is to start out there at 4 o'clock Saturday after doing the work up here. And, uh, and we'll have a good time of fellowship and fun. Somebody bring horseshoes, all right? I don't know who all has that. Uh, I think we have the, the cornhole game already um, taken care of there. Bring some horseshoes. And if you know, somebody wants to bring a football, we can throw a football. We're not playing tackle football. Ain't happening. Um, <laughs> too many broken bones that way. We can't afford it. Just That'd be about right. Just before VBS, half of us get injured. And, um, and we, we ain't going to do that. Okay, but, uh, but we will have some fun and enjoy our time Saturday evening. And so if you can help us out, that would be greatly uh, appreciated. The, uh, besides that, uh, of course, the teenagers are going to Six Flags uh, Friday. And uh, so it's going to be a very, very busy weekend, going right into an extremely busy week. Um, but um, next, next Friday will be the Six Flags trip, leaving here at 530 in the morning. And, uh, and then, of course, Saturday starts all of that procedure that we're going to be doing there as well. So that's just some updates right there of what we got going on. 
uh, this, this next week heading into next weekend. And so just keep that in mind. If you have ideas or areas that you want to uh, just suggest some things concerning VBS or whatever, we made it open to the folks there in the meeting. Please share those ideas with us. Uh, whether or not we can implement it, that's a whole other thing. We'll have to see what happens. But um, as I said in there, uh, many minds put together is a lot less tasking than just two minds trying to figure it all out. And so if you can uh, come up with something, got some ideas, uh, bring that to us, and we'll see. If we can't put it in this year, we might be able to implement it and make it even smoother for next year. But uh, we'll, we'll put all those things down and try to, try to incorporate what we can. All right. With that, uh, the choir does not have a special for tonight because we had all the different meetings. And next Sunday, there won't be any choir chairs. So they... I'll, you realize I'm going to be by myself next Sunday night? I'm not gonna, I'm, I, next Sunday morning, I'm going to have to sing and everything, lead all the stuff without y'all supporting me. I know. It, it's a rough life. It really is. But, um, but uh, I, I do appreciate the choir they've been singing. But let, let's do this. Let's all stand again, and let's take our hymn books one more time. And, uh, and since the choir doesn't have a special, we're going to go straight into another song. And let's sing 271. <laughs> and you cannot sit down for this song. Let's all stand 271. No, no, no. Oh, we got you. Okay. <laughs> 271, standing on the promises, on the first. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. on the promises of God on the second standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing on the promises of God and on the third standing on the promises of Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love's strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit's sword standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior coming down, find somebody next to you, shake their hand, smile at them, let them know how happy you are to see them this evening.
right, as we get ready to receive our offering this evening, let's sing that last verse of hymn 271 on the last. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. What a wonderful thought. And blessed promise that we have a sure and solid foundation to stand on. Well, this evening as we get ready to receive our offering. And let me give you another quote. All right. And I kind of like this one. It says, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, suffers nothing, is worth nothing. Let me me say it a little bit better because I hate the word religion. I really do. It just, religion destroys men, okay, period. A faith that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. It's not my religion in Christ, it's my faith in Christ that matters. And boy, what what a true thought that is. Um, David himself said it. I will not offer to God of that which cost me nothing. Boy, if we had that kind of commitment, we wouldn't have a problem serving the Lord. It uh, doesn't have to be painful giving, but it should hurt not to want to give. And boy, I tell you what, there's nothing, nothing better than the feeling of being, being able to give to the Lord, place in his hands what, uh, what I could not do in the same manner that God can do with it. And, uh, knowing that a place in his hands, he can multiply it and do so much more for his work. And so let's just continue to be faithful so the work of the Lord can go forward here at Bethel Baptist Church in Hartzell and, again, around the world with the missions program. So let's be faithful in all these areas of giving. With that, let's pray. And Brother Butch, would you please pray for the offering? Amen. She's already getting ready, so at this time, just before the preaching, of course, you can take your Bibles. We're going back to uh, to Second Peter chapter 1, and um, we're going to look, uh, once again, round 2 of dealing with this, uh, this very scary word of patience. And uh, so we're going to look at that as soon as Miss Wanda gets done singing.
and women are used and the weak are crushed by the strong nations gone mad jesus is sad and i don't belong i don't belong and i'm going someday home to my own I've always known this place ain't home and I don't belong. I don't belong, but while I'm here I'll be living like I've nothing to lose. And while I breathe I'll just believe that my Lord is gonna see me through. I'll not be deceived by earth's make-believe. I'll close my ears to her siren song. By praising his name, I'm not ashamed. And I don't belong. I don't belong. And I'm going someday home to my own native land. I don't belong, but I belong to a kingdom of peace where only love is the law, where children lead and captives are freed, and God becomes a baby in the straw, where dead men live and rich men give their kingdom buy back a song where sinners like me become royalty and we'll all belong yes I belong and I'm going someday home to my own native land where I belong and it seems like I hear the sound I've always known I'm going home where I belong. I can't say I've ever heard that song before. Very beautiful, though. And uh, it's very true. This, this world is not my home. At best, I'm, I'm just passing through. In other words, I can't dig roots. I can't get too planted here because uh, I'm, I'm leaving at some point and, uh, and I'll be to a place. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you just don't seem to fit in. And the worse this world gets, the more we shouldn't fit in, the more we should stick out like a sore thumb not that we're trying to be abrasive, not that we're trying to be mean, but we should just be different. Oh, let me give you a Bible word, peculiar. When somebody sees us, they see that they, that person just doesn't fit the mold of what society says is what we ought to be. Um, that's okay with me. I think I'll just go ahead and be a mold breaker in that area and just stick out for the Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody said this, they, this uh, young, a man that uh, walked down the street, and um, he was walking down, and people were just laughing and laughing and laughing as he, he was walking towards him. They could just tell everybody was laughing. And as they got closer and got the chance to see what he was wearing on the front, they just busted out. 
And then they began, people began to notice as, as folks finished, he had one of those A-frame signs over him. And as folks went to pass by him and they laughed as they looked at the front side and as they turned around to see what was on the, on the back of the board, they stopped laughing. So everybody was really curious, what's on the back? If it's so funny on the front, what's so serious? And um, so as people would walk by, they'd join in the laughing, join in the mockery because on the front it said, I'm a fool for Jesus. And as they got to the back, people got real somber because on the back it said, whose fool are you? Very, very, very true. And so um, I'd rather be a fool for Christ in the world's eyes than any other kind of fool there is. Well, let's take our Bibles. <clears throat> that was mini-message number one. All right, take our Bibles. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, starting again, we're just going to read through these, these verses as we've been doing on Sunday nights. Um, verse number 5 through verse number 7, we are dealing with adding to your faith. And so we, we have already built the foundation uh, over many weeks dealing with faith and what faith is. And, uh, and now we are looking, now that the foundation to the degree has been laid, though it's never, it's never fully finished, faith is something that we have to constantly, uh, we start off even with just a mustard seed, and that faith has to consistently grow. You have to practice it. You have to put it into action for it not only to grow, but to strengthen and stay strong. Your maintenance of your faith is as important as the starting of your faith. And many, many strong Christians started well, and then as they got into it, they got used to it, they got comfortable with it, they stopped maintaining it, they stopped worrying about their walk with the Lord in the area of faith, and then they find themselves one day not having enough faith to trust God in even the little things. It can happen to anybody. So, we laid the foundation of faith, and now we've been looking at the different things the Bible tells us here in, in 2 Peter chapter 1 that we are to add to our faith. And uh, let's just read these verses again. It says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Once again, reiterating, we are, our goal is to reach charity, the love like the Father. And if you, uh, if you can love like the Father, it's because your love of the Father is proper. And when our love for the Father is right, He can then impart to us a love like He loves in the area of loving others. And so we're, we're trying to reach that area of charity, that deep abiding love, that overabundance of desire to give of ourselves because we care for others. And uh, it's a charity, a love like Christ. So... As we look at this, we have already gone through adding to your faith virtue, that, that just the, the simple obedience, the purity of life by just obeying the Lord and the truths of God's word. And that, that virtue, when added to your faith, just enhances your walk and faith with the Lord. And then going from virtue, once we have the right heart about things. We got a foundation of faith. We have a right heart about it. And that virtue, that purity of desire to obey God, to follow him, once it's right, then you can start looking at the area of knowledge. If your heart's not right, then your knowledge focus won't be right either. You'll start gaining knowledge, as, as the Bible tells us, in, um, dealing with the world, that, uh, that they are, uh, when, when dealing with how the world thinks, which we are in today, okay, uh, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge, ever, ever growing. Listen, uh, even, even having great knowledge, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. All these things come into effect when, when the heart's not right and knowledge is built around me and not around him. Then we end up going astray with that knowledge. So before you can ever get to knowledge, the heart has to be pure. The heart has to be right. And so that knowledge we looked at is overall a knowledge concerning who God is, concerning uh, the, what he promises to be for his people. It's truths about God. It's truths from God's word. It's the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's will for our life. That is what we're searching for when our heart is right. Then it says add to knowledge temperance. We dealt with that one, which again, that wasn't fun at all because that very next week, as I, to I told you already, I had to be um, in the practice of temperance and um, 
absolute big fail. <laughs> um, I told you about the water pipes in here and, uh, and, and, and having a waterfall coming out the wall. That was not good. And it was midnight, and I was tired, and um, I, I was not very tempered. But I was by myself. It was me and the Lord, and I apologized to him later. But I was not very happy. I could have ripped the pipes out of the wall and, and just gnawed on them for a little while. I was so mad. But um, when you preach on things, or by the way, you teachers, if you teach, okay, just get ready to have to live it. Because God just has a sense of humor, and I... He, he won't put you through it until you start teaching it. Then all of a sudden, here you go, big boy. Have fun. That's exactly how I feel most of the time. So needless to say, as we dealt with temperance and all that we dealt with through that, uh, that was fun enough. Now we've been dealing with patience. And if temperance wasn't bad enough, patience is the one thing you always joke about. Never pray for patience. Why? Because tribulation worketh patience. But we've been looking at, and this is where we are tonight, uh, we've been looking at, as, as of last Sunday, um, what is patience? And, and the world has redefined a lot of things, and, and we're going we're gonna to get into, and I'll, I'll do a, a quick rehash of it, but we're going to get into the next section of patience here in just a minute. But I will tell you, the world has, and we talked about it, has redefined a lot of things in life. And they have also redefined what it is to be patient and I'll, I'll recap that here in just one second. Let me, let me pray, and then, then we'll dig back in, and we'll try to finish up tonight looking at what it means to be, in, in a biblical sense, to be patient in our lives. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the chance to be in your house, and I pray that you would help us tonight as we look at your word. Lord, we, we don't have the ability to understand without your help. We don't have the ability to comprehend the, the truths of what you want to teach us without the Holy Spirit guiding our minds and our thoughts tonight. And we, we need your help desperately. And I pray that Lord, as we look at this area of patience and the truths in your word that teach us about it, I pray that, Lord, you would make it very clear to us what it means as a child of God to learn patience and how to implement that learning, that knowledge of patience in our lives on a daily basis it is difficult, we know it is hard, and we know we are flesh, and we fight against this flesh on a daily basis. Help us to remember, Lord, that we are more than conquerors. We have the ability of victory through Christ Jesus. I pray that you would help us tonight to learn it, and also help us to be able to instill the knowledge into action in our lives after this, uh, this time of looking at patience. And we'll be careful to give you the honor and glory for all that's done and accomplished in Christ's name. Amen. So looking at patience, we did say that, of course, in the redefining of things, this world, society, has redefined many different ideas of right and wrong to water them down so they're not so, uh, so harsh. It used to be that if somebody lied to your face, it was called a bold-faced lie because that was a very bold thing to do, to lie straight to my face and know that you were lying and you did it on purpose. Now it's just called a misspeaking. They just misspoke. They, they didn't really mean, no, they meant it. But now we've got to try to soothe it over. Uh, adultery used to be considered something that was was. Very, it was awful. It, it was a home destroyer. It was a life destroyer. It, it was something you did not do unless you were not right with God, which again is still true. Okay, you cannot be right with God and live in that in, in, in sin of any type, but especially dealing in this area of adultery. You, you, well, God told me I married the wrong one, and He wanted me to have this other one. No, I'm sorry, God didn't direct you in that. Your flesh might have. But God does not direct to go contrary to his word. Sorry. But instead of adultery now, we can't use that word. That's harsh. Now we just need to call it an error in judgment. Some people never stop having errors in judgment, if that's the case. How about this one? Tolerance, we said last time, is defined now as a positive agreement to differences. You just need to learn to be tolerant. You can't be intolerant because then you're, you're, you're not very positive. You're a negative person in life. Well, there's a lot of things we said last week the Bible's not very tolerant of. And half the time, God's not very tolerant in, in what he teaches me concerning myself even. 
He doesn't let me get away with feeling good about the things I do that displease him. He still lays it out on the line, and I sometimes feel like he steps all over my toes. That's not very tolerant of me, but he is patient with me, okay? He's not tolerant of sin. God has never changed. Only man's mentalities have changed. Well, we had that same misconception we dealt with when it comes to patience. Here's what society says patience is, and here's what we bought into. Patience, by the idea of mankind, is just hold on. If you can just hold on, you can survive it a little bit longer. The idea is just grip tight, hold tight, and just pray for deliverance, and hold on until God comes through. That's the mentality of patience. But that's not biblical patience. Biblical patience goes a lot further than just holding on. Biblical patience, we did not get to the, the points last time. I just gave the introduction. I'm going to stop on that point with the introduction, and we're going to go straight into what does it mean, according to the Bible, to have patience. Patience, number one, is being able to bear it without complaining. Ouch. Um, I, I would dare say everyone in this room has failed on that one. Now, there's one person we talked about that um, ha, it, right, right now has nothing to complain about at all. That um, I have heard, and again, only got to know him this past year in the times that we got to spend together, but for the Bob Owens was somebody that, I, if there's one thing I heard out of every single person that talked to him, it was about the fact that no matter what he's been through in the last, uh, what, 10 plus years, 16 I think almost, but in all the years, not even being able to speak, in the voice box, everything gone, can't speak, couldn't actually uh, eat the solid food. They could still drink his coffee, he enjoyed his coffee, but, um, you know, but he lost what seems so important to so many people, and yet the one thing that describes Brother Bob by almost every single mouth that speaks of the testimony he had was the fact I, I never know a time that I heard him complain. He went through way more than almost anybody I've ever known goes through, has ever gone through, and I never heard him gripe and complain about what God was putting him through. Now, I haven't been here all the different years that he's been dealing with the health issues that eventually uh, he succumbed to those health issues. And we just had the funeral this past Saturday, of, or I should say the homegoing uh, celebration of Brother Bob Owens. I haven't been here to witness all of it, but I can tell you this much. When you have that many people, almost every person that talks about them, that is one thing they mention. There had to be something real about his ability to endure it without complaining. Patience, bearing without complaining. Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 tells us, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now think about that. He's saying in the midst of it all, Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That's the ability to bear it without complaining. Do you realize that a praising mouth and a complaining mouth can't dwell at the same time in the same person? When you are giving praises and when you are speaking the glad tidings, when you are rejoicing in what God has done, you can't rejoice and complain at the same time. Now, you can, you can take turns. You go back and forth and make people very confused. Are you happy about what God's done for you? Or are you complaining about what God's done? You can you go back and forth. But when you have a heart of rejoicing and a heart to follow God's word and what it says, hey, hey, not just, uh, not just to rejoice, but be exceeding glad. Have an over, overflowing, just a, a bubbliness about you. It just bubbles over. Y'all know that song. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. Okay. There's got to be something within you that no matter what you're going through as a child of God, I choose to be thankful. I choose to rejoice. I choose to be exceeding glad 
regardless of the circumstance. I, I taught kids, and I'm looking forward to very soon, hopefully, being able to do it here as well, but for, for over 12 years taught in the public schools as a volunteer coming in. That's, that, that was what I did as a missionary going in and teaching Bible character classes in the classrooms. And all the time, I constantly reiterated over and over and over again to those students that I taught month after month with different subjects, but I always came back to the ability to deal with what you're facing in life and learn how to deal with it without letting it destroy you. One of the lessons uh, that, that I wrote and put together um, in the last few years there in Louisiana teaching was a lesson on why we struggle. And I used the, the, the story of, of how some, not all, but some butterflies uh, deal uh, with, with life and, and, and how when, when they come out of that cocoon and they, they, they went in a, a caterpillar and as they, they come out of that cocoon, there are some that have to fight and have to struggle. And here's why. It's a story of a man that, um, uh, that had a, found a cocoon still all complete together and, and he thought it would be so neat to take that cocoon home and, and watch that butterfly just bloom out of there and, and, and to see the, the beauty of it. And, and so he watched it and he watched it and he noticed one day that it was about to take place. It was happening. And then as he watched and he watched almost in agony, he watched this butterfly and it was struggling. It was having a hard time. It just seemed like it was fighting and fighting and fighting and he could finally take it no more. He felt so bad for that poor butterfly, he took a little scalpel, a little knife, very sharp, and he just cut away the rest of the cocoon and broke it open and freed that butterfly. I did a wonderful thing. Then he noticed, this thing don't look right. Something's wrong with this butterfly. Its wings aren't spreading out, and, you know, it, this thing should be really just, just, you know, expanding and ready to fly, but it's all kind of shriveled up and weird looking. And how's that thing ever going to fly? He couldn't find out. It never did. That butterfly was doomed to the ground and was probably going to be lunch for something because it couldn't get away. And he found out a hard lesson, and that was that there are some butterflies that without the struggle, without the fight to get out of the cocoon, their wings do not have the strength to be what it's supposed to be to one day fly. It can get out of that cocoon, but if it has too much help, it loses its ability to be and do what it was intended to be and do. It's the struggle that gave that butterfly the potential of a fantastic future, of doing way more than it ever could do as a caterpillar. Think about it, it spent its entire life on the ground as a caterpillar, crawling around. It doesn't want to stay there once it has wings. It, it ought to be able to fly. But it was the struggle that gave it the ability and the strength to fly. See, the same thing is true when it comes to us as a child of God. We don't want the struggles. We beg God to keep us out of the struggles. And sometimes it's not the Lord. Sometimes he's the Lord that, that, that calms the seas. And sometimes he decides to be the one to calm the, not calm the storm, but calm the child in the storm. He doesn't want to take us out of the storm because it's what we're going through that's going to strengthen us and give us the ability to be what he desires for us in the future and to accomplish for his cause and the cause of the gospel around the world to accomplish what he desires as his perfect will for our life. But it's the ability to bear it without complaining. That is true patience. Paul reiterated that whole principle of not complaining during the suffering. And while you're in the suffering, no matter what state he was in, in Philippians 4, verse 11 through 13, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content even if it's Alabama, all right? Y'all going to get that in just a minute, okay? <laughs> I walked right into it, all right? Hook them horns. But, no, um, I was, uh, I, I, I begged God, Lord, send me, send me home, Lord, send me home. Let me go to, not heaven, Lord, let me go to Texas. I don't mind going to heaven. I just, I'm not ready to go on the next train, if you know what I mean. But, I, I, was, I was praying. I thought maybe the Lord was going to give me a chance to go to Texas. I was going to go home where I was born. I was, uh, I was so homesick. But 
Then wouldn't you know it, my brother in the state of Alabama, he's passionate in Alabama, one of the, became one of the worst Alabama fans I've ever, ever heard in my life until I got here. Um, but <laughs> y'all know who I'm talking about. But uh, and actually, there's a few of you here. Um, <clears throat> what, was, it, was it War Eagles? That, yeah, okay. But uh, I know, I know, sacrilege. But here's... here's my, my, my brother was awful, and he, boy, he ribbed me and ribbed me. He was a fan. He pastored down, y'all, y'all, many of y'all know who my brother was, and of course, he passed away back in December, but um, in, in all of that, I thought, the last place I want to go is Alabama. I mean, we came from Baton Rouge. Now, I'm not an LSU fan. But as soon as folks at the, at the church there in Baton Rouge found out where we were looking at and praying about going, where God might send us, you would have thought I was being exiled to the far ends of creation, to the closest thing. If, if there was a purgatory, it's got to be Alabama, okay? That's just, that's just the way they view it. And, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, Lord, going to send me to Texas. And no, he sent me here. And, but I'll be honest with you. We're not brokenhearted over that, okay? We're more than happy to be here. But, um, but patience, no matter what state, and again, they're getting back to that. As Paul said, no matter what, whatsoever state I am in, uh, I, I, every state I am therewith to be content. He goes on to say, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need you say that that doesn't make sense how can you have both things well I can be full of the joy of the Lord and yet at the same time still be hungry for more still be hungry for what God wants to give me Lord I can't get enough of what you desire for my life I still want more hey blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness listen you can be full of what the Lord has to get just constantly full and overflowing but if you don't keep filling yourself you'll stop overflowing and eventually you'll dry up so yes I've learned how to be full and be hungry at the same time how to abound and suffer need Lord Lord's been good and yet I still understand that there are needs and I still understand that there are things listen that sometimes you just feel like I'm going to suffer through it, but I know how to trust God because I know how to abound in the work of the Lord. goes on to say, and this is, this is a verse, now listen, here's where a lot of people go to. They go to one verse, they stick with that one verse, and they enjoy that one verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's a wonderful verse. I do, I, I like that verse. Very good verse. Most people use it without giving the first couple of verses before it. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Prior to that, learn how to whatever state I am, therewith to be content. You put those into context with, I can do all things through Christ, it changes the entire thing. We look and say, I can do all things. I can do, we are, we can do anything with God. Now listen, you take this modern day mentality, take this modern day piecing out the Bible and just grabbing the pieces I want to get so I can make a little slogan and I can make a selling point for t-shirts and hats and everything else. You know, the WWJD stuff. Not against the idea, what would Jesus do? That's not a bad thought. But it's become more of a selling point than it is an actual truth that we live by. And the same thing is true. I can do all things through Christ. And I don't know how many people live a life of selfish desires, live a life of selfish me, what I want. I'm going to build everything around what makes me feel good. And then when they get to things that, that they really just they want it their way, they use a verse like, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And you know their life. You know their background. You know what they post on Facebook on a regular basis. And you're like, really? You're going to use that verse to try to claim what you want? And it has nothing to do really with what God wants. It has to do with what you want. It's very obvious. Now, I'm not being accusative, but you know the kind of people I'm talking about. It happens all the time. That is society's mentality of Scripture. 
pick and choose and grab and piece together and let's make it what we want it to be so I can feel good about myself. And so they use a verse like I can do all things and forget that before, before all that, he talks about suffering. He talks about enduring. He talks about patience, learning to be content, knowing that in all of this, I can do all things. Hey, I can learn patience. I can learn that for whatever state I'm in, I can learn to be content because I can do all things. That's not the context that most people look at that verse in. Patience, very simply, is bearing no matter how much it requires. It's bearing it no matter how much it requires and doing it without complaining. A couple more verses. I don't know how many more weeks we're going to be dealing with patience, but it's going to be a while. Y'all have to be patient, okay? <laughs> I'm teaching that very faithfully. All right, 2 Corinthians 1, verse number 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our con consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Listen, the sufferings of Christ. Think of how much he suffered and the fact that we're promised as a child of God, if we reflect Christ, we can expect suffering. We can expect uh, to be persecuted. We can expect the world, society, to not understand and to attack because if they hated the Lord, they're going to hate those who follow Him. And the whole thing comes down to so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. We don't survive what life is going to dish out to the child of God and what society is going to help it dish out. Listen, I said before, life at the Garden of Eden prior to sin was perfect. It was intended to always be perfect. It was intended to never have suffering, never have sorrow. It was intended to be a constant walk with the Lord and fellowship with the Creator. That was life's original purpose. And that's a lot of rain. But that is life's original purpose. But watch, as soon as sin came into the picture, Life's purpose now is what came about by proclamation of decree from God Himself as the consequence of sin. And that is pain, that is suffering, and that is toil, and that is sweat. Everything in life now is not about the beauty of it. Life is not about the wonderful things. Life is not about how much I can enjoy. No, life is all about pain. Because life itself is a consequence of sin now that from the point Adam and Eve rebelled. And of course, wherefore as by one man, it's mainly Adam's problem. He knew better. God gave him direct instructions and he broke them. He willfully chose. Wherefore, as by, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Since that moment, life's purpose is to bring pain. So what are all the good things, preacher? What are all the wonderful things in life? Simple. That's God's blessings in spite of what life is supposed to be. That's God giving the ability to enjoy what shouldn't be enjoyable. That's God's giving the ability to His children to be able to learn what it is to not just endure and not just to survive, but to live in the blessings of God when life itself is supposed to be all about the consequences of sin. We're supposed to be miserable. I sweat 24-7. It's miserable. That's life. You ever heard the saying, that's life, get over it? Guess what? Everything you hate, that's life. Get over it. So, hey, preacher, so how do we enjoy life? Simple. You put yourself in the center of God's will and let Him bless in spite of what life dishes out, in spite of what society throws your way, in spite of all the things that go against you. The only way we find any positive, the only way, way we find any joy, the only way we find, as the Bible says, any consolation, it's by Christ. It's being in the center of God's will. How do we know patience? How do we understand these things of just enduring and bearing it without complaining? We learn it through Christ, through following Him. Last verse, we're done. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange 
concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. As though some strange thing happened to you. Hey, how many times has that happened? I just don't get it. Why is this happening to me? Have you ever seen the Facebook posts? I know some of you may not be on Facebook. It's almost comical, but honestly, I can't, well, I can't read too much of it because it really just irritates me after a while. But have you ever seen where people spend more time, they write booklets on Facebook about how unfair life is. And then in the midst of telling people not to be judgmental, they turn right around and they, they spew out a whole bunch of venom about their judgment towards other people. Don't judge me, but I'm telling you what, you people out there. Now listen, if, there, if there's one thing I despise, it's when supposed Christians, and if I'm not careful, I'll be one of them. I'm not, I'm not excluding myself. We're all susceptible. But if there's one thing that just eats me alive is seeing a person who claims to be a Christian and in one post shares this stuff about Bible verses and everything, and the very next post acts like an absolute heathen, spewing out everything they possibly can, griping and complaining about, this is just not fair. I don't know what's going on. Why are people being so... I mean, just on and on and on. And you can tell that scripture verse they posted two days ago didn't help them whatsoever. Because it's just something to post. It's just... It, it's, the social media life, folks, is a complete farce, if you want to put it that way. It is complete... Uh, just a shell... It is one more way that people can appear to be spiritual and yet be as empty and dead like dry bones. They're white, as the Bible puts it, whited sepulchers. Beautiful on the outside and full of dead men's bones. That, that, listen, it's, I'm not saying everybody on Facebook is that way. I'm not saying everybody that posts, posts scripture and stuff like that it is all fake. What I'm saying is you can tell the ones who are obviously not right with God and they just use Bible, use scripture, use spiritual things to appear better than they really are because the only one being fooled is the one doing it. Everyone else can tell. And unfortunately, it puts a stain on the cause of Christ. The Bible instructs us, 1 Peter 4, where I was, 12 and 13, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the, the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Listen, don't blow up. Don't lose it on, on social media or any other place where people, you're supposed to be a child of God. You're supposed to trust God. Don't show everything but a trust for the Lord when you're in the midst of society that's watching for something to blame on Christians, some fake thing they can point out. Goes on to say in verse number 13, but rejoice. That seems like an odd request, or even I should say command. It doesn't say consider rejoicing, it says rejoice. In, in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. I sure would hate to think that one day I'm going to stand before the Lord and his glory is going to be shown and I'm going to have to possibly in some areas just hang my head in shame because I should have been acting this way and yet I was acting that way and now that I'm to a point where I could be standing tall by my Savior and saying, he's the one I was trusting. See, he's the proof of everything that I said I believed in. I'd hate to think that I'm going to have to head, hang my head sometimes and say I really didn't give him the credit that I, I thought I did. I really didn't represent him the way I thought I did. I sure would like to have the promise that's given to us that we can stand with him when his glory is revealed. I can stand there with exceeding joy. You see? <laughs> I told you. I told, not that it's about me. No, but look. It's real. It was true. He is a wonderful Savior. He's everything He promised and more. If I'm going to be able to do that, I've got to be able to, in these days where I live, in the time frame God's given me in life, I've got to learn to live by biblical patience, bearing it without complaining. I don't understand why. I don't get every answer. 
I don't have every single definition of what God plans to do through all these things. Listen, only he knows the big picture. I just see the small pieces, and sometimes they're just not too pretty. But I'll trust him anyways. And I'll find something to be thankful for in everything. It's not for everything, but in everything. Give thanks. Another command. <clears throat> Learning how to be joyful even when it's not a joyful time. Say, how do we do it, preacher? Consider him. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. That would be me. That would be you. Such a contradiction to himself, and yet he still chose to endure. He still chose to suffer. Consider him, and when I consider what he's done, I can suffer what I'm suffering and be thankful for what he did for me. I can learn to have joy and be patient in his perfect will. You say, does that come real easy? Nope. It comes with a lot of practice and a lot of trusting. And that faith you say you have, that foundation of faith in Christ, you've got to rely and stay on that foundation. Don't walk away. Let it remain. Let it build. Adding to your faith these different things. And we'll pick up number two next week dealing with patience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the chance to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for your love. We, we can't thank you enough for how patient you are with us. Were it not for your patience and long-suffering with each one of us, we, we'd be in so much trouble. There would be no hope. Well, we thank you that you love us in spite of us. And you desire the best for us in spite of who we are and what we do. Lord, and also you desire to use us in ways that by ourselves we wouldn't be useful. But yet you place within us and give us the opportunity to trust you, to allow you to use us as willing vessels. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to learn this area of patience and make it a very real thing in our hearts and in our lives. We'll trust you for it. Pray that you take this time of invitation. There's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior. May they get that settled tonight. In Christ's name we ask it all. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? I don't know if the Lord dealt with your heart at all. Something may be laid on your heart. An area of patience you're struggling with. I don't know what it is. The altar's open. The altar's here. This is where you can deal, deal with the Lord, do business with the Lord. As she plays the piano, why don't you spend time with the Lord? Say, preacher, I can't kneel at the altar. You already know my answer to that. You can deal with the Lord right there in your seat. But if you can come to an altar, use it. Let this be where your tears flow. Let this be where your time is spent before the Lord. Take your burdens. Leave them here. Let them happen. The invitation's open. soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Y'all sing the verse with me, the chorus. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. That deals with salvation of a lost individual bound for hell. It also deals with the salvation of a child of God that already knows where they're headed for eternity. But listen, if there's one person who can save us from ourselves, spare us from this flesh and the issues we fight with in this flesh, it's our Savior. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. Don't trust this flesh. Don't trust your heart. It'll lead you wrong because it's wicked. Trust the Savior. Thank you so much for being. I should. I ought to just keep on preaching. Y'all don't want to go out in that. All right. But uh, thank y'all for being here, honestly. Uh, visitors, thank y'all. I, I appreciate y'all being here. And the church family, 
Uh, again, I want to challenge you, please pray. Pray for VBS. Spend all week. Take every single day and spend some time praying that the Lord would, would do a work now. Start putting together now what He wants to do one week from Monday as we get ready for VBS to start at that time frame. And we'll, we'll pray, put our faith in Him, trust Him, and be patient for what He desires to do at VBS here at Bethlehem. Again, thank you all for being in God's house. And you all be careful going home. It's, uh, it's a little nasty out there right now. I will say this. I don't know. i got to go check it. But uh, give the Lord a little bit of glory for a second. With the roof fix so far, we had a downpour like this the other day. I went to the steeple, saw zero water. Some of y'all understand what that means, okay? We had an issue at that little area over there the other day when it downpoured. We had water pouring in the building where the, that metal is. The two roofs come together right there, that little hall by where the, uh, the, um, the snack machines and stuff are now. You know where it used to leak and it hadn't been leaking forever? Well, it was, I mean, water falling through the wood. I about panicked. My wife called me in there. She was panicked. That was bad. When she gets panicked, we're in trouble. Um, I called them. They got over here right away, found where the problem was, spent, the ne they patched it for a minute. They came back the next day, spent two and a half, almost three hours working on it. And it seems to be fixed. No issues. And so, thank